getting out of tax and getting out of STAR and all this stuff with testing to be able to get to the exemplary rating. We cannot do that with the money that we have because of our special interests, our special needs groups that we have in this district. It is just impossible to make that happen. So for you to sit up there and spout back to us that we need to become exemplary and that's your answer for us, instead of giving us golden pennies, which I was also, I was actually who introduced you to Gina as the PTO president at Jacobs Well, we had several conversations about that's what we need. And a career politician across the hall from you does not know Wimberley, Texas like we do. You need to be listening to your constituents and not to the career politicians across the hall from you. I'm not telling you to get your schools to exemplary. And actually, I, I, I made a comment about bills that I filed that were based on exemplary rated schools. And I actually shelved those bills and went with a Democrat's bill that based on student performance. So if you have 1% of your students doing very well on standardized testing, they would get an exemption. That saves money. And there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But if you have 70% of your students doing well on standardized testing, they would get an exemption. That saves money. The less people that you have taking standardized tests on an annual basis saves money. That's why I didn't pursue my bills. That's a drop in the bucket in our district. We still have coordinators, we still have teachers that are not going to be able to teach because kids are going to be out of their classrooms. We still have to schedule the testing. It's not enough for us. Um, and that's what we're asking you to listen to us, that we are asking for local control. We're asking for local control and we're asking for more golden pennies because we know after going through this for almost 10 years now, what is going to work for what we need. And I am one of those parents who spent hours and hours and hours at Austin going back and forth talking to people up there. I had education aides that ran from me when they saw me in the hall. <laughs> and that's okay. I don't care. And I am more than happy to help do that again. But the bottom line is, according to Omar, Y'all aren't going to do anything until y'all sit back and see where the court takes us. And so my question is, is if that's really what's going to happen, Omar, what is your suggestion for us? What do we do? If they're not going to listen to us when we're there, because they're not going to take it over and take the bull by the horns because nobody else has been willing to, what do we do? Well, I, I will say that some of the members of Pub Ed have told me that they are going to work to restore the funding that was cut. Now, if that means that we start at where we are now and move up, I, I don't know. But this is, the, the members of the Public Education Committee, at least a couple of them, have made it clear they want to restore some of the funding. And if, and if I had my way, you'd have 109 golden pennies. I like lo local control. I'd rather you have your money and keep it here locally. Not that there aren't schools that are around the school district that need additional funding. There are rural schools that, that are recipients. They're Chapter 42. They need money as well. We've just got to find another way to appropriate that money to them without taking it from districts like Wimberley. We've got to work on the calculations and how you determine what's a Chapter 41 or a victim of Robin Hood, if you will. I mean, that's what Robin Hood does, steal from the rich and, and give to the poor. I mean, that's, that's a simple example. Do the poor districts need money? Yes, we've got to find a way to get them those funds. But are we really stealing from the rich in this particular case? Looking at these numbers, it doesn't sound like Wimberley's too rich, in, in my opinion, compared to some other school districts. I mean, we're hurting. Hey, question? Yeah, can I just ask a quick question and a little clarification maybe from you, Omar? We talk about Chapter 42 schools who have charter buses and big football stadiums and all of that stuff. That money has to come from somewhere. Well, they have a target revenue, just like Waverly has a target revenue. They're only going to get so much. But my question is, is the formula that they use for calculating that, is that fair and equitable? Is the federal money they get added into that target revenue area? Or is that only state money? And would that, if we could figure that formula out and make the formula more equitable, would that then still pay 
pay for those students, but the federal money would be figured in at the, at the target revenue as well, which would stay the state money because some of that federal money would take up some of that. Target, target revenue is only state money, it does not include any federal money. And it was based on where you were, where a district was in either 2005, 2006, or 2006, 2007, where they would have been in 2006, 2007, had it not been for the bill that brought target revenue into being. Uh, so you were frozen at that level, and that was for 06, 07, 07, 08, and 08, 09. In 09, 10, House Bill 3646 was passed by the 2009 session that gave everybody a minimum $120 increase above your 06, 07, or 05, 06 level. So everybody got at least 120 bucks more per student in beginning with 09, 10. So that lasted for 09, 10, and 10, 11. And then comes 11, 12, where everybody gets cut by the $4 billion uh, that they cut across the board of, of, of state funding for, for this current value. So no, it, it does not include any federal money, and, and the argument that you hear for not including federal money in that mix of equations is that that money is tied specifically for certain things. You can't, you don't have any discretion on how you use that money. You apply for the federal government to use it in a certain way, and you have to use it in that way or else they take it back. So you don't have much control once, you, once that application gets approved. You don't have any discretion on how it's used. You have to use it in the way you told them it was going to be used in the way it got approved to be used. And once that happens, then it's got to be spent that way or it goes back to the federal government. Well, I can understand that, and I understand that part of that money may be to help feed students. But we still have to feed students at, at the Wimberley District as well. So we're taking money out of regular M&O money to feed our students, whereas they are getting federal money to feed their students. So it still cost us our money locally to feed these students, whereas federal money, and, and I may be totally wrong about this. The federal money does pay for students that qualify for free and free price lunch. Right. We reimburse the school district for that, for that cost, yes. Okay. Okay. But somehow they get money to drive these charter buses and have these big things. I'd like to know where that money comes from and see if the, we could save money at the state level and, and equalize some of that out. And I, I appreciate educating students. I do. I don't have a problem with that. And I think everybody should be educated well. But I think that we need to figure out how to do that truly equitably. So. Yeah. That, was also some, that was also some feedback that we got from our education summit that we had. And I tried to work with our legislative uh, council that does that basically writes the language for our bills. And we tried to include the federal dollars in the Robin Hood calculations. And I said, that's because you, I kept hearing story after story about these elaborate campuses and charter buses and things like that, embellishments. And these are chapter 42 school districts that are getting our tax dollars. And with the federal money coming in, it, it, it was something we just couldn't do. Representative Dan Branch, 